Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this week's Ask the Experts workshop. I am Dr. Pamela Herstella Pietra, President and Founder of Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, and host of this popular series. Children and Screens is a leading convener, funder, and curator of scientific research and public education on the topics of digital media and child development. We are so pleased to welcome our interdisciplinary panel of world-renowned experts, clinicians, and researchers who will share the most up-to-date research on how to optimize virtual communication and learning for children and adolescents on the autism spectrum. You will hear expert guidance on best practices for media use today, and we are particularly pleased to have a special guest with us, Dr. Temple Grandin, who will share her thoughts as a neurodiverse person and her experiences with respect to screens and children. Our panelists have reviewed uh, your questions and will answer as many as possible during and after their presentations. If you have additional questions during the workshop, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and indicate whether or not you'd like to ask your question live on camera or if you prefer that the moderator read your question. I'm happy to share that almost 600 people have registered today uh, for today's workshop. So although we may, uh, well, so although we'll try to answer as many as possible, uh, we'll just be able to address as many as time permits. We're recording today's workshop and have, hope to upload a video onto YouTube in the coming days. Tomorrow you'll receive a link to our YouTube channel where you'll find videos from our past webinars as well. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Matthew Lerner. Dr. Lerner is an Associate Professor of Psychology, Psychiatry, and Pediatrics in the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook University and Research Director of the Aut uh, Stony Brook Autism Initiative. Dr. Lerner's research focuses on understanding emergence and real-world implications of social problems in children and adolescents, especially those with autism spectrum disorders. Welcome, Dr. Lerner. Thank you, Pam, and uh, thank you so, uh, so much uh, for uh, convening this panel today. Um, as uh, the great interest <laughs> that has emerged over the last week has shown, um, the relevance of the work of children in screens to the autism community is abundant. Uh, briefly, uh, as hopefully most of us here uh, know, autism is a uh, lifelong uh, neurodevelopmental disorder that uh, primarily affects the domains of social communication and restricted uh, and repetitive behaviors. In practice, what this means is that many folks uh, with autism uh, struggle uh, socially uh, to connect in uh, real world in real time. Uh, this then means that the emergence of the era of ubiquitous screens has been incredibly relevant for this community, uh, but that that relevance has presented uh, opportunities and challenges. On the one hand, uh, screens provide a medium for communication, uh, for, for engagement, as well as for disconnection, when one feels overwhelmed potentially, um, that uh, is much more widely available than at any time uh, previously in history. On the other hand, you know, there are potentially risks to over-engagement in screen uh, uh, media over the course of development in lots of different ways. Um, and uh, the uh, utility of screens and perhaps even the, uh, the greater engagement um, in screens among some folks with ASD uh, means that those same risks uh, may also be present uh, for those with ASD and in some cases may even be magna uh, magnified. So here today, uh, we have a, a spectacular panel convened uh, who's here to give you an array of perspectives uh, across the spectrum, no pun intended, um, uh, on what the, the strengths, challenges, opportunities, and practical implications of working with, uh, of, of living in a world of screens with autism can be. Um, and so uh, I'm really quite pleased uh, to be able to, to share this, uh, this opportunity with you, uh, with you all, because I think there's, there's a lot we're going to learn, even in the uh, pre-discussions that the panelists have had. I sat there thinking, gosh, I wish I was writing all this down. Well, thankfully, you don't have to write this down. This is being recorded for you today. So sit back, enjoy. Remember, the last uh, half an hour or so is going to be uh, Q&A which is gonna be moderated uh, by the wonderful staff of Children and Screens. So 
Um, please stay for the presentations, stick around for the Q&A, and uh, hopefully uh, you're all going to learn as much as I already have in the discussions that we've had thus far. Um, and so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce you to our first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Merrill Alper. Uh, Dr. Alper is an assistant professor of the communication studies at Northeastern University, where she researches the social and cultural implications of communication technologies with a focus on disability and digital media, children and families technology use and mobile communication. Dr. Alper draws on over 15 years of professional experience in educational children's, in educational children's media uh, as a researcher, strategist and consultant, including with organizations like Sesame Workshop, PBS Kids, Nickelodeon and Disney and uh, has uh, numerous publications, including uh, uh, awarded publications uh, in the domain of understanding uh, how the digital world uh, works for people today, uh, including those with disabilities. Uh, and so with that, um, I will hand it over to Dr. Alper. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I will uh, go over to my screens, uh, or kind of slides here to share with you all. Wonderful. So I uh, thought I would share with you all today uh, a little bit about who I am, kind of what I do, and uh, kind of the practical advice that I have to share with parents based on that work. So who am I? So in my research, I use ethnographic methods like parent and child interviews and home observations to study the role of media and technology in children's and families' lives particularly for youth on the autism spectrum. And this photo is actually of one of my research participants, Oscar, which is a pseudonym. All the names I'll be using are pseudonyms. Uh, a three-year-old autistic child in his living room, taken, of course, at a time when researchers could still go into other people's homes before the coronavirus pandemic. And what I really love about this photo is um, he's surrounded by different forms of media. You've got books on the floor, you've got letters, foam shapes on the floor. You've also got a TV remote that's sort of scattered amongst the midst. And you also have a computer keyboard that is on a little tykes table, but it's not attached to a computer. It's just the keyboard itself. Because Oscar was really into words. Oscar was into words, um, not only kind of through visually, but just off screen, there's a, there would be a large screen, a large flat screen TV playing a kind of a near continuous loop of YouTube videos related to letters and words. So in this kind of environment, both within a child's home and an environment beyond the home, I try to take what's known as an ecological perspective on child development and digital media, inspired by the psychologist Uri Bronfenbrenner. So that means that I look at all the factors that directly or indirectly shape any one kid's media use, including their home life, the safety of their neighborhoods, the influence of technology companies and their policies, etc. So I also keep in mind that children on the spectrum are both similar and different from their neurotypical peers in a number of ways. So in terms of similarities, they have gender, racial, ethnic, class, and geographic profiles and backgrounds that impact their media use just like any other child. And it's important to note, um, including here two photos of kids from my research, Amaya on the left and Orion on the right, that Black and Latinx children in the United States are pretty much absent from a lot of the research that's on autistic kids and media use. A lot of it is done with, with white children, and a lot of it um, includes a lot of boys. Um, we can talk about kind of gender differences in um, diagnosis, but the research that exists basically is not representative. So anything that we're able to tell you is somewhat incomplete. Research, the thing I love about research, is it's an ongoing process. So while those are similarities, um, in terms of differences though, autistic kids can have specific but varied challenges with things like sensory processing, understanding and expressing language, following expected rules of social interaction, and emotion regulation. So, 
I'd like to provide some practical screen use tips for parents based on my research, highlighting both the benefits and challenges of digital media for autistic kids, including recreational use and also for the purposes of online learning. So I'll break this down into six key developmental areas. The first being social development. And the big thing here is to use media with your child to communicate and connect. So some autistic children may actually be more connected than ever to their classmates through, say, video games with chat functions right now, especially those who might never have been included in after school play kind of in the pre COVID times. Other autistic kids may find that this sort of electronic way of communicating of texts or Snapchats just doesn't replace the potentials of in person encounters and the social cues that those kinds of encounters can provide. So I'd say that for parents, this is a time to really use media together. So things like family movie nights or kind of multiplayer video games and whatever kind of cognitive le of level is appropriate for your child, but to use those kind of ways of using, of, of kind of centering around media um, to kind of promote social communication. So next, in terms of emotional development, to be attentive to how media can both stress and soothe. So children on the autism spectrum can be very empathetic, so much so that the news might be, and everything that's going on, might be emotionally overwhelming right now. Others might express emotions in a more reserved way, but are choosing media content that is helping them process experiences of disruption and change. And this might especially be true for non-speaking kids or, um, children whose kind of expressive language um, is, di is difficult to, to, to express. So media can also be a way of communicating that inner state. So it's important though to help children learn, of course, to regulate their emotions in ways that don't always involve the comfort of a screen, but to recognize the emotional valence that screens may have. Cognitively, um, it's a time to help kids become critical, autistic kids become critical thinkers about media and technology. So some autistic children have the ability to fully grasp the complexity of what they see and read online, while many others might not understand the content that they're watching on YouTube is an advertisement or what is or isn't appropriate to post on social media. So one tip I think is to meet your child where they are through their personal interests and to watch things or scroll together and explain what might be confusing for them. Next, in terms of behavior, is to set reasonable boundaries around media, but to give your kids an active role in that boundary setting. So media can provide a sense of routine, a very comforting routine for autistic children who thrive with clear schedules and plans. But some might be very sensitive to excessive media use, regularly impacting their ability to self-regulate or transition to non-media activities. To help with this, involve your kids in making predictable and safe choices about their media and technology use while respecting their agency and helping them to learn to make good decisions. Um, next, in terms of sleep, consider how media can both work with and against a child's sleeping habits. So autistic kids tend to have non-normative sleeping habits to begin with. So right now, for example, thinking about online school, not having to keep the early schedule of school by attending classes in person, but instead online, might actually be a relief for a lot of them right now. That flexibility might be something they've, their parents at least have been craving. So here screens can kind of help with kind of working around sleep. But of course, if you think media, for example, before bed is making things worse, then it's really time to think about small, kind of iterative changes about developing new routines, um, but especially during kind of these unstable times, the sort of sudden or like non-incremental changes about sleep and screens could also be particularly disruptive as well. Um, and then lastly, creativity. So to give autistic kids large canvases, if you will, kind of metaphorically both physical and digital. So some autistic kids have amazing kind of artistic skills. So big stretches of free time and supportive adults at home right now, potentially um, might allow them to work on some great things. But even for kids who have screens, um, but you know, that's not kind of the place to always go, or also just plenty of kids without 
internet access or kind of screens beyond just a mobile consumption device. Um, thinking about sort of those, those paper-based kind of ways of building and world building that those kids might crave, but um, non-screen ways of doing that with these large stretches of time. One last thing to say is that I'm finding in my research that a lot of the advice that parents of autistic kids get, especially from kind of clinicians, tends to focus on their child's media use. So rules or like how to talk about media. And that's what's known as direct parental mediation. But modeling and the example that parents themselves set through their own media use, what's known as indirect parental mediation, is also really important to reflect on, especially if kids are sort of focused on modeling. In what ways are they modeling screens kind of at dinner or screens kind of during the same things that they're told not to do? Um, so to close up here, thank you so much for sharing, letting me share these insights, which I hope provide just sort of a little bit of clarity, but of course, not, not enough time to really get into, the, into things. So if you'd like more information, um, I've written a bit about these topics. Um, on the left is a report called Digital Youth with Disabilities. That's a report that was funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, that's available as a free PDF online. Um, I've written kind of some other things as well, but if you kind of would like more information, um, I'm on Twitter at Merrill Alper, or you can uh, go to my website, MerrillAlper.com. And I hope the conversation here is useful, although I have to hop off, I'm sorry, at 1 p.m. to go to another um, of these Zoom seminars. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Alper. There's uh, so much rich uh, information uh, that you shared there. Um, I think I think it's it's particularly uh, notable that many much of the the practical uh, advice that Dr. Alper is sharing, and this is hopefully going to be a theme uh, for for today as well, is uh, very much in the domain of the, the the sorts of things we would share with many parents uh, in general regarding you know, the ways in which their uh, their children um, learn, uh, the way that screen exposure uh, affects uh, their learning and things like sleep, uh, and the way that parental modeling imp impacts children. And I think, you know, I think that this is such an, an important topic as, as I think there, there's sometimes a misunderstanding in the community that, um, you know, uh, because somebody uh, is, is autistic uh, and might really love their screen, their screen media or be extremely attracted uh, to their screen media, that that uh, uh, somehow means that, that uh, the, the ways in which we can help or the ways in which we, we might work or even support that child are, are going to be so radically different. But of course, people are people <laughs> and people want other people and want to be and, and want to, to you know feel enmeshed in their social and emotional environment um, including often, especially uh, uh, autistic individuals. I think your point, particularly, that um, many autistic folks are uh, not just empathic, but often radically so, um, and that screens uh, can sometimes the, the way in which that 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 interacts with with the uh, perhaps uh, overwhelming emotional environment that they're in is so key and often I think underappreciated um, in the field. Um, so uh, I had lots of thoughts on that. We also have, a, have time for a couple of questions uh, as well um, uh, before we move on to our next speaker. Um, so uh, kicking it uh, back to you, um, if you had um, one healthy screen habit, is a, a question from the audience, one healthy screen habit you could share with parents regarding their family's technology use, what would it be? Yeah, so looking at the research, um, what is something that we know overwhelmingly has a potentially negative effect is what's known as background television. So that's kind of having the TV on and nobody's really watching. So the ways that that impacts children's kind of free play, the way that that impacts children's cognitive processing, their expressive language. Um, but it also actually, going back to the parental mediation, impacts parents because then they're not also communicating with their kid. Um, so that child-directed speech. So, so wanting to kind of contextualize that, but the kind of autism kind of twist on that is that background television or background noise or white noise is part of this broader sensory suite of young, that autistic people. That's where the kind of the, I think there's kind of advice that is general good and then like autism, especially specific. 
but there are some kids for whom if you take away that, that sensory comfort, then what else replaces it? So understanding that background TV, while we know like research-wise can have all these negative effects, then what kind of sensory experience might that kind of noise or a visual kind of, um, you know, effect might have. So I think to, to kind of point it to somebody else's research, um, there's a professor, Chris Harrison at University of Michigan, who's written about kind of what she calls sensory curation or media sensory curation and, and gating. And the ways that that media, if you kind of take a kid away and they have, a, and they have like a meltdown, is that how much is that behavior linked to the, the sensory mode that that particular media might be supporting them from? So thinking about kind of the senses. Um, so, so that's why I think like people like OTs, occupational therapists have a lot to add to these kind of conversations too, with thinking about the sensory components of media in relation to all kind of elements, sensory elements of a space for kids. But, but in general, background TV, if it's on, not the best thing to have. Thank you. That's a really um, valuable piece of advice uh, for, for all of us. Uh, as, as, as a parent, it's, a, it's a helpful for me to hear as well, I'm sure, as well for many other parents on the call. And I think, um, I, I think that also you, you highlight um, in your answer something uh, ex you know, extremely important about understanding and working um, with uh, those with autism which is uh, the fact that many of these, the motivators uh, that are entwined with, with really anything, but I think TV and media, media and uh, screen media in particular, um, uh, are intertwined. So I think that it can, uh, I know with the families you know, that I've worked with, for instance, even in regard to this, this particular issue, um, it may not immediately seem that, for instance, the sensory component is what's driving the draw, or or even the the reduction of uh, the regulation of the sensory environment <laughs> is what's uh, um, you know making a child say uh, uh, that they need the TV on or really want want the TV on. Um, but this is why, uh, again, consulting with folks like OTs and getting uh, that that uh, kind of insight and having some sort of guided experimentation uh, as a parent with the guidance of a clinician can be so helpful. So you can capture and disentangle those things, which again, a, as a parent, um, you might, you might miss uh, in part because it really might be that Thomas, Thomas, the, the tank engine is genuinely motivating. And that can also be true on top of the sensory demands. <laughs> um, and we actually have a minute for uh, one more quick uh, question for you before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, which is, um, are there any media platforms that are research supported and recommended by, by you? <laughs> sure, yeah. So uh, it's a research kind of, I think, developed platform and also a lot of research has been done on it. Um, now this is not a platform that's necessarily for all autistic kids, but certainly um, kind of ones that I have seen who, and I always say this is, uh, it, it's, it's been, anyway, it's called Scratch. So Scratch is an online platform for learning how to kind of computer code, but in this like really blocky language. So there's been all sorts of research on kids with cognitive develop, um, d uh, disabilities or intellectual disabilities using it, of kind of adapting it for, for blind you know, child audiences. It's this, it's this platform that, um, and I've seen in my research, um, that it's a place for kids to be able to like creatively kind of iterate on something, but it's also as a community, the ways that some of these kids might prefer to socialize, it's really adaptable. Um, and it's also something that like as a community, in terms, so it's basically you, it's like you learn how to, you can code stuff, but then you also, you make these projects, you make animations, you make um, games and you have other kids play them and it's all very moderated and it was scratch as a platform was developed by MIT and so MIT it's like spun off now as a separate foundation but it basically put all this research into it also d does all this research and there's also a kind of a space on there where kids autistic kids like have posted videos like their animations about how they have pride in being autistic or like what it means to be a kid on the spectrum but they also like created it by kind of code themselves. So again, this is not all, all kids, but there is like a wide array of the, the power of being able to express yourself, especially for kids for whom 
language in, in its like traditional forms might not be the easiest way for them to communicate. So it's both, it's like kid friendly content because you can just view the projects, but you can also make it. So I would say that Scratch, again, not, all, not for all kids, but it's from the, what I've seen in my research, some kids who really get a lot out of it as a positive pro-social space that has kind of adult moderators and that there's research evidence behind it. It's kind of, kind of I think maybe like one of the only platforms I can say um, for that. Well, uh, Dr. Alper, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for your insights. Um, we uh, now have Temple Grandin who is uh, going to be coming on uh, and um, so I just want to let you know she she did she was able to get on she's getting on here she is perfect Hi, so um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Temple Grandin uh, well known uh, to, to many of us of course for her trailblazing work as a self-advocate in the autism community and her lifelong work in animal behavior uh, oh, right. yeah. so I will uh, uh, so um, Dr. Grandin um, has uh, provided uh, remarkable groundbreaking insights into both her own autistic mind and the perspectives of autistic people. And uh, she shares that knowledge with the world, uh, aiding in uh, treatment and support and understanding of individuals. Uh, and with that, uh, Dr. Grandin, the floor is yours. Well, it's good to be here, trying to fit things in between some other industry conferences that I've been on. And I'm and I'll just talk a little bit about myself and then I'd like to open it up to a whole bunch of questions. Uh, when I was three years old, I had no speech, had excellent early intervention, and um, my ability in art was always uh, encouraged. Take the thing the kid's good at, build on it, build it into a career. That's something I want to see happen. And we got to control the video games. We got to control that. Let me tell you what I'm seeing. There's two paths to the basement to play video games on social security check, or do we get out and have a life? Too many kids are not learning working skills. The problem we've got with autism now is you're going from somebody who ought to be working at Silicon Valley, or maybe working at a very high end skilled trade or in art, to somebody who can't dress themselves. And it's all called the same thing. Now, when I was a little kid, I looked really severe, but fortunately, with a lot of early therapy, I was kind of you know, pulled out of that. But you got to get these kids out doing stuff. I'm seeing too many kids aren't learning basic skills like shopping. Uh, they're not learning basic work skills. I spent 25 years in heavy construction. And I've done a lot of thinking about identity. My identity is a professor first, an inventor first. I was just on an industry uh, conference and we were talking about how to some engineering stuff that had to be done. Okay, that's the sort of stuff that's my basic identity. Autism is important to who I am, but it's secondary to career. Silicon Valley, half the programmers out there are autistic. They avoid the labels because I'm seeing too many kids, smart kids, good grades, where the autism is becoming the total label. And you're going to be a better advocate if you get out there and you show the stuff you can do. And one of the things that motivated me to do the projects I did back in the 70s that were shown in the movie is I wanted to prove I wasn't stupid and that I actually could do it. Now there's different kinds of thinking. I'm a visual thinker. I think in pictures. So I'm gonna be good at things like industrial design and skilled trades. And I'm gonna estimate that about 20% of the high-end skilled trades people I work with, designing big complicated Tyson and Cargill plants, were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And I am saying that seriously, totally, totally seriously. I, those kids are never got a chance to use tools. I was using tools by second grade. The worst things that schools have done is taking out the hands-on classes. Now, the thing I'm not able to do is I can't do algebra. I'm seeing that as a gatekeeper to screen kids out of things like high-end skilled trades. We're losing skills. Let me tell you, we didn't know how to build the Steve Jobs Theater, structural glass walls, carbon fiber roof. It's from Italy and Germany. And we don't know how to build a poultry processing plant anymore. And there's a connection here between the special ed world and the industrial world. And, and I'd, I'm not gonna say skilled trades are for everybody, but for a lot of the visual thinkers, like me, it would be a really good way to go. Then you have the mathematicians, your pattern thinkers, they're your programmers, your engineers. And then you got the word thinkers. They'd be very good at things like um, uh, 
specialty retail, selling cars. There's been some real success in that. Selling specialized business insurance, where they're recognized for a special um, knowledge. We need all the different kinds of minds. Now, just a few hints on the workplace. Long strings of verbal information, that doesn't work. You've got to give them a pilot's checklist to jog the memory, because I got no working memory. Don't stick me on a super crazy busy takeout window. That's not going to work. What I'd like to do now is, while I get a drink of water, is just get a few questions. Get somebody to ask some questions, either on the chat or just verbally. I'm going to get a drink of water real fast. Great. Thank you, Dr. Grennan. So we have, yeah, I, yeah, I will uh, kill some time while you get drink some drink of water. I'll talk real slow. Uh, no, so um, we, we have, that's done. Perfect. So we had um, some folks submit questions in advance, so I'll just pass them forward to you. Okay, uh, great. Great. So um, uh, one person ask, asked, what can therapists and teachers do to support those who have trouble focusing? Uh, or, or uh, controlling their focus to focus on the things that are needed by their parent or their teacher? Well, first of all, need, well, this is very general, and mm -hmm. they find focusing on video games real easy. And one of the things that got me interested in education is when education became a pathway to a goal. Not just education for the sake of being educated. Um, when I was in third grade, I didn't know how to read. Mother had to teach me how to read. And she taught me with phonics, and I very quickly went first grade level up, sixth grade level of reading. Um, take, find something the kid's really interested in. So you're reading about something they're going to be interested in, like maybe cars or spaceships or, or dogs, you know, whatever, something they're interested in. Um, I've also got to get an idea of the level of the child. See, the other problem we've got here, well, as soon as the kid's a little, little bit older, you've got kids that ought to be going into engineering school or programming. And then you've got individuals, well, that's not a reasonable option. You've got a spectrum that's just so broad and that every, and, and they, when the kids get older, they need really different services. So the first thing I ask is age. Um, and then, well, does he talk? What can he do? Can he read? Can he dress himself? You know, kind of have three different levels. You might have a kid who's really good at math. Why don't you introduce programming? I talked to one family, mom and dad were programmers. And I said, well, do you ever think to teach your kid programming? See if he likes it? It hadn't crossed their mind. They'd gotten so much kind of in the disability mindset, they didn't think to teach your kid programming. And I've been out to Silicon Valley, and let me tell you, half those programmers are on the spectrum. Been there, seen them, been to the major companies. And, and uh, we got to start looking at what they can do. Also, a person with autism is a bottom-up thinker. So you get them out doing things, the more you fill up the database, then they get more flexible in their thinking. I've had parents say, well, he got a job at an office supply store and he just blossomed. No, we've got to deal with the work thing. Chores for little kids, um, volunteer jobs at a church or a, or a farmer's market when they're like 12. These are some of the things we need to be doing. Learn how to do a task on a schedule outside the family, stuff that they have to learn. The other big thing I'm seeing is all these grandfathers come up to me and grandfather uh, was an engineer or an accountant, or maybe he um, worked fixing the electrical wires. And um, he was definitely, he finds out he's autistic when the grandkids get diagnosed, but he had learned how to work. Also in my generation, social skills were taught in a much more systematic way. And that helped them. You know, we were taught to say please and thank you. You were taught not to, talk about certain subjects at the table. You were taught uh, not to tell the same story six times. These things were just taught. Okay, let's get another question. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> somebody asked, uh, what is your thought about helping kids connect socially on video games for kids who have trouble making connections in school? Well, there is a place for some of those multiplayer games where they can talk to their friends because that is an avenue for socialization. So I wouldn't ban it, but six hours a day on it's not acceptable. An hour a day, um, a little just use the rules that we used in the 50s of watching TV. One hour a day during the week, two hours a day on Saturday and Sunday. They can <laughs> play that game. And, and that is a social avenue. But I'm seeing things where all the kid does is play video games all day. And that's not mm -hmm. acceptable. And the research is very clear 
these kids are more likely to have problematic video gaming. And on the international um, diagnostic system, uh, video gaming is, can become a disorder. Yeah. You're playing video games for six hours a day. You're not doing anything else. And, and the other thing, give the kid some choices of other alternative activities. You know, you could, you could do uh, this sport or that sport, or you could do karate or some other thing, or you could take an art class or take a programming class, give them some choices. But just sitting on the, in the bedroom all the time, no. You're gonna have to come to meals. We need to have sit down meals, learn turn taking in conversation. That was taught to me. These were things that were taught. Now, shoving the kid into a bunch of sensory overload, that's not going to work. I wouldn't pick out the busy, crazy Walmart at Christmas. That's going to be sensory overload. That won't work. Um, and then if you have a child that's got a bad sound sensitivity problem, let's say it's to the hairdryer, let the kid control that hairdryer. Where they are turning it on and off, and they control it. They might actually get to like the hairdryer. Uh, when they shut it on and off and control it. That's another important thing. But I want to see these kids getting out and doing things because I'm very concerned about loss of skills. Some of the stuff we don't know how to build anymore. And people stick their nose up at, at skilled trades. Let me tell you, high-end skilled trades, and I'm not talking about roofing or floor tiles. High-end stuff, you'll have a job. Everybody else at Disneyland's getting laid off right now. The airlines are tanking in the financially. High-end skilled trades. You'll have a job for life, no matter how much COVID we have or how big a recession we have. Awesome. And, and that's why I'm pushing that right now, because it's a totally economic slow down proof job. Somebody's still got to fix the electric stuff, make it work, and, uh, and build things. Yeah, house framing, I probably wouldn't get into that. That's too cyclical, <laughs> super hard work. Oil patch, too cyclical, wouldn't go there. I know where the jobs are. <laughs> and where they're going to stay. I just got off a seminar that I had to tune out of from Cargill and the ethanol industry was really messed up. This was a big mess. So a lot of corn was going into ethanol and cattle feeders were feeding it. And, um, that industry got totally disrupted. I wouldn't want to be working in those plants. They're coming back on now. It's not as bad as, as hospitality and recreation and sports. That's way worse, way, way worse. All right, uh, one last question, um, and then we'll uh, move on. So, you know, Dr. Grennan, you have a unique perspective on the way the autistic community has evolved over time, um, you know, having been a prominent member of the community now for decades. So I'm curious if you have thoughts about ha the rise of screens everywhere um how if there's any ways in which that has uniquely you, you've seen changes within the autistic community that are, are are unique or that are different than the changes that we see more broadly in the world now that screens are everywhere. well i don't i think that the biggest problem more than the screens is is i've seen moms that just can't let go and i suggested their 16 year old student with good grades should go shopping she started bursting into tears and says, I can't let go. You know, this problem of not learning enough skills. And, and the other thing I'm finding is with normal young people today, they don't even know how to look stuff up online. Um, that's something I do in my class now. I make them uh, look up journal articles on different databases and summarize them. So mm -hmm. they learn, you know, learn some online skills that are actually worth learning. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've got to um, um, put hands-on classes back in the schools. Some of these uh, cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, welding, car mechanics. That's something we need to be doing. Um, I've never passed an algebra course to this day. That's screening out an awful lot of kids. I know how to do my old-fashioned 50s math up to sixth grade. That I know how to do. Um, where... But I'm seeing too many kids where you, what you have to do is you got to stretch these kids. Mother knew just how hard to push them. You don't shove them into a big sensory overload, but you give them some choices of different things. You got to stretch. Now, right now I'm working I'm on the phone with some people in Florida and there's a young lady that wanted to call me and she was afraid to call me. And I told her mentor, 
about how I was afraid to uh, make a sales call, cold call, when I first started, my boss made me do it. And I found out I was able to do it. And so I wrote back and I said, and I told that story when my boss made me do it. She needs to do it, not with you. She needs to do it. And she did. Then I just got a text, la an email last night that she's doing all these things. She changed all the light bulbs that were, you had to get up a ladder to change in their house. You know, she'd never done stuff like that before. Well, that's an example of stretching. And there was no trauma there. It's just stretching. And, and I, we got to start getting the mindset of what they can do. And um, we don't have enough of that mindset. And, and um, because let me tell you, I worked with, I, I know a guy, 20 patents, owns an international metal fabrication company, owns it. He sells stuff all around the world. He's as autistic as he could be, and he stutters too. How about, okay, here, let me tell you about two private jets and how that got him. High end skilled trades. The real high end. I'm not talking about flooring and, and roofing and that kind of stuff. I'm talking real high end stuff. He has a big international shop, um, started really little, makes difficult to manufacture products. So I have to disguise what he does. I, and the other guy, he builds uh, specialized factories. He just got a jet. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, and you know what his education was? High school welding class. And he sucked at algebra. He's building big, complicated factories. He's got two jobs going on right now. I was just on one of the jobs. See, this is what makes me crazy as I go back and forth between the, uh, you know, the, the different, you know, disciplines. Um, introducing tools, that needs to start early. They like Legos? Well, let's build things with tools, too, and then you combine stuff you build with the Legos. That's just fine. Get them into robotics classes. Um, sewing. I'll tell you a good job, just a, a seamstress to repair clothing. You'll have a job forever. You know, a lot of the essential jobs. Okay, what do you do with the kid who can't do algebra? Okay, let's say, put me in a time machine and you made me 20 years old right now. But I had the knowledge I got now. I'll tell you where I'll go. Amazon warehouse is where I'm going to go. And I'm going to learn every job on that floor to prove I can do it. You know what my goal is? 15 years later, I want to design the next one. I kind of did that with the meat industry. I saw a lot of people go into the meat industry, learn every job on the floor, gravitate to maintenance. <coughs> 20 years later, they get to play with giant Legos with a crane. It's a lot more fun. It's called concrete tilt up. It's called pre-stressed panels. A lot more fun. And, and uh, that's, you see there's, these are the back doors into things, but you can't just go in there and tell them what to do. You've got to work your hindy off doing every job on that floor first. You've got to pay your dues. Yeah, I would do that. I'd work every job on that floor in that warehouse. And if I was 20 years old now, um, I, and I had the knowledge I had, that's where I'd go. Because the other advantage of a big corporation is there's so many places you can go in that. Yeah, it, the other big problem with a lot of the employment stuff is they're not differentiating where bagging groceries is a training job and where bagging groceries is a suitable career. For some clients, it is a suitable career. But I'm seeing way too much not um, moving on past that. There's too much sort of getting in the disability box. So I'm trying to bust you out of that. That's what I'm trying to do. Industry's a fun place. <laughs> But now, they, now, now I just left the conference on the ethanol plants were down and they were showing a graph of how the market uh, tanked. Uh, and they're coming back online now. I um, wouldn't want to be in the working for Disneyland right now. They're just laying off 20,000 people right now. That's another reason why I'm pushing high end skilled trades, fixing electric wires, uh, welders that can read drawings and just make anything car mechanics, auto mechanics, the real high-end stuff, jobs forever, no matter what happens. Plumbers, electricians. It's a two-year community college degree for fixing the um, electrical wires to bring the power in. Yeah, and let me tell you, they need a lot of fixing, especially in California, they just let them fall apart. That's true. And I get, true. I get um, kind of excited about this, and you need and the visual thinkers are really good at fixing that stuff. 
it's, um, I want to see these kids get out and do things. And then there's others where maybe bagging groceries is an appropriate career. And there's others where, yeah, we're going to have to teach them how to dress themselves. You see, for me, it's not abstract. I like to see different, you know, individual, different clients. But I'm seeing too many kids going nowhere. And, uh, you know, we need their skills. And Silicon Valley's hiring right now, right now. Yeah. High-end programmers for artificial intelligence. But how's yeah. your kid going to learn programming if you don't expose them? I got into the cattle industry because I got yeah. exposed to it. <laughs> I can't emphasize yeah. enough how important that is. And that, okay. that's, inc that's incredibly helpful, to, uh, to, uh, Dr. Gunning, because there's actually a lot of, uh, several of the other questions actually were, we're asking about that, so you've, you've, you've answered many of them. Uh, we've got, I've got one, one last one I've been asked to, to, to bring to you um, before we let you go. So, um, uh, of course, um, you know, one uh, big shift in the modern era of screens is potentially the availability of tools and supports for minimally verbal uh, autistic individuals. There's so, a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's so, a, if you're working with minimally verbal, here's three books you need to read. Tito Makapete. How can I talk if my lips don't move? Types independently. They got a locked in syndrome. They can't control their emotions. Another great book, The Reason I Jump, and an even better book is the sequel. The sequel has a funny title, like fall down five times, get up nine times. I can never remember them. The sequel's a better book. And he describes that he can't control his movements. Then there's Carly's voice. And all three of these type independently, completely independently. You're working with nonverbals, Facebooks are must reads. And again, Let's see what they can do. Here's a great individual story. A guy named, a doctor named Jed Baker took a, um, a nonverbal person out of an institution, adult. He taught him how to make coffee at the local gas station. And he was appreciated for his really good coffee. He became the coffee man. That gave him meaning in life. That was an appropriate job for him. The coffee man at the local gas station. That's just an example of finding something in the neighborhood where they can do a task that other people would want and appreciate. And then when he went to a nursing home, he was the coffee man for the nursing home. Well, um, Dr. Grannon, thank you so much uh, for, for your time and for your insights. Um, you're of course welcome to, uh, to, to stick around for our next uh, speakers if, if, if you'd like or I yes. Uh, I, I thought so. Yeah, you got well, your next I, thing. I had to leave the ethanol plants, <laughs> which I'm supposed yes. to be watching for my continuing education. Got I, it. I'm now to come here, and I've got another Zoom call at 11 my time, mm -hmm. and they wanted me on there 15 minutes ahead of time, and I've got to go. Go, go for it. I got to uh, get that. I'm glad mm -hmm. I was able to get with you. Just Thank you for joining us. And I, we hope we were more, even more engaging than ethanol. Uh, well, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're definitely more engaging than ethanol. And another <laughs> thing that I learned is what you got to do when you're different is sell your work. I'm going to just show you my drawings. This is how I did an interview. Hopefully that's nice and clear and you can see it. I ah. pull up my drawings and I, I laid my drawings out on the desk and I'd show them to people. I sold my work, mm -hmm. not myself. That, and I'm to put a bunch of pictures in there with it too. Okay, I am going to have to go now. But thank you, thank you very much. And I was glad that I was able to be here briefly. Um, you want to learn about the different kinds of minds. My book, The Autistic Brain, describes the different kinds of minds. I have another book called The Way I See It, my most basic book on autism, The Way I See It. Uh, everything's available on Amazon in ebook or regular book. And it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Temple, for your insights. Uh, you're so wonderful. Okay, um, I'm glad I was able to be on here at least briefly. Take care. Wonderful. Okay, we thanks. appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Bye. You well. Thank you. I'm gonna leave the meeting now. Goodbye. <laughs> bye, bye. See you soon. Wonderful. Um, so uh, uh, again, we're uh, so pleased uh, to have. Uh, Dr. Grannon, join us uh, today. Um, our next speaker um, today is Christopher Flint. Uh, Christopher founded and is the president of uh, Action, A-A-C-T-I-O-N, Autism, a humanitarian volunteer organization dedicated to supporting developing countries in their efforts to better identify, accept, and educate individuals on the autism spectrum. Most recently, Christopher is the founder and chief creative officer of, Infinite, of Infiniteach, 
uh, a social enterprise which develops educational and accessibility apps for the autism community. So incredibly relevant, obviously, to uh, so many of the things we've talked about already. Um, I'm pleased to give you uh, Christopher Foote. Great, thank you so much, Matt. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for everybody joining and for all the other panelists and for Temple and her always unique and wonderful insights into the autism community. Um, what I'd like to do today as we get started here is um, give you a little bit of view into some of the digital tools for the ASD community. And some of these tools are going to be um, things that are available today that are readily available to you to download and start using. And some of them are gonna be more trends that I see kind of in the digital space with the autism community. At the end of the slides, I have links to everything. So you'll be able to get all of those as well. Um, but I've been working in the autism field for over 20 years now. And as I was preparing for this presentation, I started looking back at some of my things. And one of my earliest clients, whose name was Jeffrey, um, one of his interests was German chocolate cake. And it was around the time of MySpace. And he actually got kicked off of MySpace because he shared over 300 recipes of German chocolate cakes. And the early days of the internet, 300 recipes, just they couldn't handle it. So, um, but he actually met a good friend over MySpace in those days and is still a friend to this day of Jeffrey. And so I've always been interested in this intersection of autism and digital um, digital opportunities. So we're going to go over just a few assumptions I have. We'll talk a little bit about some technology for executive functioning, data collection, um, a little bit about communication and social technology, and then finish it off with tech for an inclusive world. So just from my thinking, you know, to frame this talk, I'd like to think about uh, technology and screens as supplemental intervention, right? I think as we've heard Dr. Elper and Temple say that technology isn't um, the full answer for these kids and having kids on technology all day long for any kid, you know, especially a kid on the autism spectrum who struggles with social interactions probably isn't the best idea, right? And so when we're thinking about the things that I'm sharing today, we're thinking about things that can enhance other types of activities. Um, the other thing that we should really be careful about is that all technology interventions should have a path to generalization, right? We see that many individuals on the autism spectrum struggle with taking skills off of the screen. And so if you're doing something that involves a screen with a child with autism, we should be thinking, how do we bring that into the real world? And I think Temple did a great job of, of emphasizing that and saying, you know, how do we get kids into more jobs, more real world types of things? Um, and then the other thing to think about is we should use technology for what it's good at, right? For things that humans aren't so great at. And so things like data collection, right? Or things like um, executive functioning things, you know, things that it's, it's harder for humans to do that. Technology can take some of the weight off of educators, parents, um, and use technology to help with some of those tasks. Is, is <laughs> And then the final thing, of course, is there's such a broad range of autism spectrum disorders and in only a few minutes, I can only share so much. So none of these are specific endorsements for products, um, but more just to give an overview of what's out there as people are looking for different types of interventions. So with that, um, let's get started here. Um, one of the things I think technology is really useful for, and I've seen, you know, especially now during distance learning and kids learning at home, is scheduling, right? It seems like there's just this amorphous day where it's hard to decipher one day from the next, and even weekends seem to lose their meaning, right? And so using technology for things like scheduling, I think can be really, really helpful. Here's an example of one of those tools. This is an app called ChoiceWorks. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, it's $7. But the nice thing about some of these scheduling tools are they allow you to you know, create your own schedules, insert your own pictures, easily customize schedules. Um, this one's really nice because it allows you to put in time as well. And so I've seen a lot of parents use this for homeschooling. When you have this kind of set schedule of when you know math classes and reading and when you're going to check in with your teacher so you can add times to this and um, you know like we see with a lot of individuals on the spectrum the more structure they have around the day the better they tend to do and so apps like this can be really really helpful 
for supporting individuals on the autism spectrum. So thinking about, and there's you know, hundreds of them out there. This is just one that I chose to show, but think about, you know, searching things like scheduling or calendars and having these things on devices can be really helpful to kind of organize and help with that of executive functioning of individuals on the spectrum. Data collection is another great tool that we can use, especially during um, pandemic times when kids are at home and parents are looking for trends in behavior and looking towards interventions, right? Um, you know, at school, hopefully teachers were taking a lot of this data, but now that parents are more responsible, I think finding apps that can take some of that burden um, to look for trends, right? When are kids having meltdowns? When are kids having hard times? Is it after screen time, before screen time? And so here is just an example. There's a, a company called Birdhouse. Um, they have a specific autism app and you can log in different data points and then graph them in various different ways to look for trends and you can look for things like you know behavioral trends attention and focus types of trends and again technology does a great job with this it would be hard for a person to remember all of these things accurately but technology can be really really helpful um, with data collection over time um, communication, I think there are definitely benefits when it comes to communication in autism. I'm going to share a quick video with you. This one is called GoTalk and it's actually a app that was designed for the Apple Watch. And so wearables are also getting, uh, uh, becoming very popular and trending right now. Hi, can I show you a cool app from my Apple Watch? It's called GoTalk Wow and it helps kids with autism communicate. It has ready to go messages. Hello. I'm thirsty. Or record your own. My new drawing is almost ready. My new drawing is almost ready. Talk about a good movie. Have you seen Captain Marvel? Or just make plans. Let's go get a burger. Want more volume? Pair with the uh, as you can see from that short clip that having a wearable device for kids that are minimally verbal or get anxious in social situations, having a device that can help prompt or get these social interactions started or these communications started could be tremendously helpful. And again, you know, it, it's, there's an expense to it. And so the app itself is $50. You'll get an Apple Watch now for about $300, so about $350, which is much cheaper than a standalone um, device used to be. But still, it's an investment to, to kind of get things going. Um, in terms of some of the trends where things are going, you know, a lot of these things aren't out now, but if we look at things like um, translations, right? So let's take a look at this quick video. Good evening, sir. How may I assist you? Thank you. Hello, I'm speaking to Deutsch. Uh, sorry, I apologize. Okay, Google. German interpreter. Ready when you are. How may I help you, sir? Wie kann ich Ihnen helfen, sir? So technology has come a long way in terms of real-time translation, and there's an example of how it might work. Uh, we see this with individuals with autism, especially minimally verbal or nonverbal individuals with autism that have trouble. And parents might understand their unique gestures and words, but to a novel person, it might not make much sense. And there's actually people out there now that are using machine learning to help with these issues. And so what they'll do is they'll get these devices and they'll put them in kids' shirt, they'll record kids, and then parents can actually code what these different things mean, right? And then it, what this app does in real time is it helps translate these vocalizations or these gestures that nobody else might know into real world types of things. And so this child is saying that he wants a drink, but nobody else might know what that means. But through this app, it can actually translate his movements or his vocalizations into a language that other people could understand. And so again, you know, something that would be really, really difficult to do without technology that technology is allowing us to do. Augmented Connect reality. Eye to eye, eye contact. That kind yeah. of Augmented reality is another um, place where I think technology can be really helpful for individuals on the spectrum. There's a really cool company called Brain Power that's doing some of this work. Um, this is readily available, it's commercially available. You can take a little, we'll watch this just for a few seconds so you can see some of the potential with it. Connect eye to eye, eye contact, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, so with eye contact, which seems like such a simple social grace, but it's so important to tell the other person that you care and that you're paying attention. Well, when I look at you, suddenly your face becomes this cool cartoon, catches my attention, and then... And here we have it on the video kind of showing what you're explaining, right? Exactly. So his mom becomes this funny dog, and as he looks, he's getting points for making the eye contact. And if he's feeling stress, we measure that stress so we can dial back the game. This is not supposed to be hard. This is not supposed to 
you can see in that video, this student here, the child with autism is wearing Google glasses. And it's actually putting things over the person to help them focus, it will help them with eye contact, know what they're supposed to pay attention to. Um, there's also some cool stuff with a new technology from Microsoft called the HoloLens that's doing the same type of thing that's helping individuals with autism recognize emotions. Um, just by looking at faces, there's little pop-ups that come onto your screen, almost a heads-up display that can give you more information that a person with autism might have trouble understanding. And then virtual reality is the other thing um, that's helping out. So here's a quick example of how that might work. This is from a company called Florio. Here's an example of Florio VR. When the devices are paired, the monitor can see the learner's view between these two green lines, as well as some of the area outside of the view of the learner. Banner language is delivered here to provide guidance to the monitor. In this lesson, the monitor has some simple controls used to direct the lesson. This learning card is called Emma is Pointing. In this lesson, the monitor is able to choose an animal. When the learner looks at the safari guide, Emma, Emma will point to that animal. The banner shows a speak icon when displaying suggested language that the monitor may say to the learner. So you can see from that example, the student's wearing a virtual reality headset and it's working on joint attention. So following a point, following a gaze of a different learner, all within a virtual reality environment. And so these are things that are out today that people are using um, that are doing research on. And then finally, to wrap things up, um, you know, I think another place that technology has an important role is in creating an inclusive world. And that's where my work comes in with my company, Infiniteach. And so we're developing technology to help individuals on the autism spectrum go to places they love with the people they love. And so we have apps for places like aquariums and museums where it might be overwhelming or hard for individuals with autism and their families to go to, um, present them with things like social guides and sensory guides to help them better navigate these places and become part of the world and go to places like dental offices and have training for the staff there so that they're better able to welcome and provide access to those places as well. As I said, there are some slides here that we can definitely share that have links to all of these things. But again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share all of these with you. And there's a lot more to get into, but I will stop there. Christopher, that was fantastic. And, uh, you know, again, this is another moment where it's uh, so great that this is all being recorded <laughs> because there is so much uh, good information uh, that you're sharing at the moment. Uh, so, so many good, good tools. Um, so, uh, I guess, we, so one of the questions um, that uh, sort of emerging uh, from the audience is, you know, many folks with ASD, of course, you know, who are, uh, have strong interest in screen media might have, again, specific activities that they are particularly uh, interested in, in using. Uh, and of course, the idea here with all of these tools you're talking about is to sort of leverage that interest towards something that can really be, you know, could be valuable or, or helpful learning tool. Um, so, I guess, do you have advice or guidance for, for families for uh, introducing, how best to introduce somebody who say really interested in a specific video game, for instance, uh, one of these uh, more novel technologies that, that you and others have developed? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I think, you know, for some individuals, it just being technology is enough and they're interested in just exploring new technology. But for other kids, you know, I think having a very thoughtful approach to understanding the context of what's going on, right? I think just putting something in front of a kid for the first time and saying, here, explore, maybe not the best option for all kids on the spectrum, but helping them understand the purpose, the why, I think is one of the most important reasons that we can help individuals know. And so pairing these types of technologies or devices with the actual purpose that's going on. And so like with our technology, for example, um, we've encouraged parents and gone with kids that have actually been at the museum, like driving to the museum and we'll help them get ready by using our social guides in the app, right? And so pairing it with a wor real world example of how mm -hmm. it's going to work or pay off, I think could be one way that we can help introduce these things. So kids can make the connection and get the meaning behind the why of, of using it. Great. And then last question uh, for you, then we're going to have our, our Q&A with all of us in a little bit uh, after Dr. Dunkley. Um, but uh, is there any uh, software that you're aware of to help non-autistics become more inclusive? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. And so, you know, I think the best way that we have to help with that sort of opportunity is through training right, is to be able to provide best practice information, to have the voices of the autism community heard and um, understood. And so listening to people like Dr. Grandin speak, um, conferences like this, training that we provide through Infiniteach and other companies to really understand, you know, what autism is and how to provide interactions. And I think that there's almost this, you know, scary sense for a lot of people of interacting with a person with autism the first time and not knowing what to do or the right thing to do is. And information and communication is obviously the best tool we have to defeat any bias. And so I think that's the best thing we can do is provide resources to, to train and information to help with, with those types of situations. Perfect. Well, Christopher, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move now on to our, uh, our last uh, presenter, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Uh, Victoria Dunkley, and then we're going to have an open Q&A uh, with those of us who are still here, as well as a, an additional member of our panel, uh, Dina Gassner, who I'll introduce in a moment as well. Uh, so first, uh, Dr. Dunkley is an award-winning integrative child and adolescent psychiatrist based at the Center for Life in Los Angeles. She is a nationally recognized expert on the impact of screen time and brain health and development and is a leading voice regarding screen time's influence on psychiatric disorders, addiction, and the overuse of medication in children. The floor is yours, Dr. Dunkley. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, I'm here to talk about the negative aspects of screen time and how uh, screen time impacts the, the neurophysiology of the brain. And I know it's kind of confusing for parents to hear like, you know, what the technology can do and then the negative effects. So really as a clinician, all I care about is what makes a person better and what makes them worse. So you can do things in a certain order. So first you wanna stabilize the, the child, then you wanna optimize their brain development, and then and only then use, utilize technology as needed, you know, for um, things that you couldn't get any other way. So that's kind of how I approach it. Um, okay, so there's certain thing, there's certain aspects about ASD in general. Um, one is that, as everyone has mentioned, like ASD kids are intensely drawn to technology. They have a very high risk of addiction and um, heavy use in general. Uh, parents are more likely to use technology or devices to control behavior with autistic kids compared to their siblings. And parents are also less likely to set limits with technology with ASD kids. We also, there's also pressure to use technology because it's um, normal um, and that it may be a relative strength for a child to like use the computer. So there, so a lot of people, a lot of adults end up encouraging the child. So as you can see, this is kind of a setup or a recipe for, for tech overuse. Um, but the problem is we're not just dealing with tech addiction. There's also just side effects to technology in general. So um, screen time is actually psychoactive. It has very potent effects on the brain and it acts like a stimulant. So much of the effects we see mimic um, stimulant drugs, including, you know, things like caffeine or even cocaine, but also just if you even med medication. So when I first started looking at this, I noticed that when kids used, um, especially in the, in the ASD population, that they would have a lot of the same symptoms as kids who are taking like Ritalin. They would have tics. They would be more um, twitchy. They would be acting out more. They would be crying when, the, when, it, when they got off the screen. So it mimics that kind of that same cycle of being very over-focused and then withdrawing and being very weepy and irritable. Um, I also, you know, I've been working on this topic for 20 years. Um, and, you know, back when I first started looking at it, it was just video games. Obviously, everything's a lot worse now, but literally, all I do all day, all day long now is, um, is work on reversing all of these effects that are happening. So um, a bigger issue is that a lot of these side effects actually exacerbate aspects of autism that the, the autism brain already has. It's inherent in autism. So I'm just going to go over a couple of those examples. Um, there's many of them. But one is that it causes hyperarousal and children with autism are already in a state of hyperarousal and they have trouble regulating their arousal. Another is that it suppresses melatonin, the sleep, the sleep um, hormone. And melatonin isn't just for sleep, it also is an anti-inflammatory. And children with autism have an, uh, an um, inflammation in the brain to begin with. 
Um, it also, we know over time, that screen time reduces connectivity in the brain in the white matter. And that's another inherent aspect of autism is that their brain is not as connected. We also know it fractures attention. Children with autism have a fragile attention, uh, fra attention system to begin with. And then we know even with typical children, it delays speech and language. Um, and obviously that's, that's an issue with this population as well. And, and what I see also is that screen time diminishes eye contact. So a lot of times when I take kids off of screens, we immediately see within a week, we see an improvement in eye contact. And we see this in the typical population, but it's obviously very um, even more relevant in this population because eye contact impacts brain development. So you're actually rewiring the brain when there's eye contact, face-to-face -face conversation, all of those things. And you see, and they can mimic more, they, um, you know, the more they're off the screen, the more they're able to make eye contact, mimic facial expressions. Also, they're viewing the whole body and that has to do with um, reading, reading body language and things like that. So there's a lot of issues. Okay, so let me just do, go over a couple slides here. Okay, so, whoops. Okay, so really this slide is just to show you that tech addiction does actually damage the brain. Um, and as we, you know, this is a whole list of kind of findings they've had, they've seen in brain imaging. There's atrophy in the gray matter in the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is really the, the area that we're trying to focus on with all, with all children because that's where you have mood regulation, executive functioning, creativity, empathy, all of the things that make us human. And you can see here in this actual slide that's up here, uh, white matter um, fragmentation. And that's the same thing I was talking about with the connectivity. And the point of this is that it might, be, it might seem strange that they would actually have brain damage when they're not ingesting something, but the eyes are actually part of the central nervous system. So it actually makes sense that when, they're, when you're taking something in through the eyes, you actually do impact the brain and it can be quite potent. So another aspect that's really important to understand is that screens hijack the social reward pathways. Um, so those, and this is for every, any kind of addiction, but especially for tech addiction. And those pathways were really meant, they're, they're there for um, an evolutionary reason. They're there to keep the, the baby close to the mother. So those are the pathways that get hijacked. And of course, those are the same pathways that we really want to work on and stimulate in a, in a healthy way in a, with a person to person rather than screen to person. And we also know that a healthy um, attachment between the parent and child is protective against tech addiction. So you're literally rewiring those networks and protecting them the more time you spend with them and that they're off the screen. Um, and then the other aspects that are important is that in, you know, in previous generations, teenagers naturally went through this awkward stage during adolescence. And obviously this awkwardness is even worse for, for kids on the spectrum but now they're not getting the same practice. So it used to just be through practice, we would become less awkward and be, get better at our social skills and they're losing those opportunities now. So what I do with every child, teen and young adult that I see, um, as long as they're willing, <laughs> um, is we start with a four week electronic fast. And what this does is it kind of reverses all of the physiological changes that screen time causes. So it resets the body clock, um, it, it reduces hyperarousal, which, which in turn brings blood flow to the frontal lobe. Um, the, the reward pathways get very intensely stimulated with screen time, and then they become overstimulated and desensitized, so it's hard for, it's hard for the child to, to engage in, in non-screen activities. So it kind of resets those symptoms and resensitizes them, and it lowers the stress response. And then of course, with all of those things, they sleep more deeply, which is reparative in itself. They start um, you know, playing more um, physically, getting their, you know, more hands-on, things like that. So we, we see a reversal physiologically, and then functionally, 
you can see, as I mentioned, you know, kids are talking more, they're happier, they're, they're more able to follow rules, they're not being bombarded all the time. So you see them kind of blossom. And that's, you know, I think Dr. Grandy mentioned that same term. And that's exactly what I do with children is that, and young adults, you know, I just try to get them very hands on, I try to get them doing something physical. We know that the, we know what works for brain development. And those things are bonding, rough and tumble play, face-to-face -face conversation, eye contact, art, creativity. Um, so, the, and those are all things that are reduced and, and time spent outdoors, nature, green spaces. Those are all things that are reduced when, when um, technology is in place. And just a quick, um, a quick case study here. This is just someone who did the, she started doing the four week fast and then she you know, continued with it. And this is a six year old boy with autism, heavily addicted to technology. Um, he was addicted to Minecraft. They got rid of all devices, even their own computers. <laughs> um, but he was so addicted, he was out of the family, like act out scenes from Minecraft. So she, she said he went from literally kicking and screaming and not wanting to leave the house to playing at the park, going to the library, playing with his siblings. She said he wouldn't sit on her lap to read a book. Now he was not only sitting on her lap, but he would out look at books himself. Um, in the classroom, all of the teachers made comments about what, you know, what did you do? What's going on? Um, he, his handwriting changed. That's a, that's a sign the frontal lobe is becoming more integrated. And I see that often. Um, and we just, this is a very, this may sound dramatic, but this is like a very typical response. So this is kind of, you know, my method and I look at things um, functionally. And then after, you know, once the child has been reset, then we have them, um, you know, we discuss with the parents all the risks and benefits of reintroducing. If they want to reintroduce, we do it very slowly and methodically and we always pull back. But this process can take years to kind of find, you know, the sweet spot. And some kids need years to just be off technology altogether before they can even tolerate any. So that's my perspective. And sorry if I went over. <laughs> no, that is, is perfect, uh, Dr. Dunkley. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> quick announcement, um, uh, which is that uh, due to uh, the uh, great uh, interest here and also um, uh, I want to make time for everybody. Uh, the end of the session is now being pushed to 1.45, so we have a little bit more time for open Q&A. Uh, those of you in the audience uh, will have opportunities as well. If you um, uh, put them into the Q&A uh, to be called on, you can, you can speak uh, for yourself directly um, to, to our panel. Uh, one question uh, for Dr. Dunkley, though, before we uh, move on to that, uh, which is, um, uh, Carol Ann. So Carol Ann, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Hi, good afternoon. I am from Massachusetts. And the question I had was, what are some strategies that we can use with our ASD children to get off a lot of screen time without intense outbursts? Well, the, the outbursts that you see are is because the nervous system is dysregulated and they can't regulate their arousal levels. So you have this very intense stimulation and then when they come off, it's a withdrawal. So, that, so that's why I always, I always advocate for just going cold turkey for a few weeks because even if you cut back, the nervous system, once it gets into that state of dysregulation, tends to stay that way. So it's not, you know, cutting back is of course better than nothing but you won't see uh, it qualitatively and quantitatively. It's, it's a totally different um, response when you actually take them off altogether. And then they kind of grieve, you know, not, not using the screen for fun and everything. And then you see them come alive. So I always just tell people like, um, you know, just do it for four weeks, look at it as an experiment and see what happens. And then after the four weeks, you can kind of decide if you want to go back or not, or, you know, in small amounts, but, that's the, the whole, that's, you know, this whole, the whole meltdown thing associated with screens has been taken over my life <laughs> for the last, you know, like I mentioned, I started this 20 years ago, but really the last 10 years, this is my, you know, I really want to raise awareness as to that issue. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, uh, so we're now uh, going to uh, turn to, uh, and thank you, Carol Ann, thank you, Dr. Dunkley. We're now gonna turn uh, to our, our discussion. And um, I'm thrilled uh, to let you know that another um, spectacular uh, expert has joined us as well for our discussion. 
Uh, so um, you can now see her on your screen. Um, please introduce Dina Gassner. Dina is a renowned scholar, self-advocate, parent, advocate, and speaker in the autistic community. She's a PhD candidate uh, at, in social work at Adelphi University and adjunct faculty at Towson University. She serves on numerous boards and consultant roles, including the ARC of the United States, and has presented all over the world on, on the topic of autism, including at the United Nations. She has a growing number of publications and a wide range of academic and popular outlets, including the widely read book, Spectrum Women. Uh, she's also just a wonderful human being, a true mensch, and a great person to, to join our conversation today. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see, we have uh, some questions uh, to be thrown uh, to the panel. So, um, uh, I believe the first one is from uh, Rafia. Okay. Uh, okay, it uh, looks like they'll, uh, we need a, a minute for uh, Rafia to get set. So actually, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, so we've heard um, a... Uh, Hi, I'm here. Oh, perfect. All right. Okay. All right, Rafia. Uh, can I share sure my the video? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So um, my question here uh, was... Uh, how for nonverbal um, uh, children, uh, how do we uh, provide them with uh, the right amount of um, technology or um, therapy per se to get them to to uh, enunciate or speak or even say um, words? Let's say they already use their communication device, but they're still not trying to even repeat those, they're just kind of touching it and telling us what they want. Can any, any answer or do, did you? <laughs> Dina, do you want to start the, to kick us off? Well, I, I mean, I just think that, um, that it, for me personally, the focus is to have a, a valuable, usable form of communication. Um, and verbal language is only really valuable to the people who want to hear his voice, um, not as valuable to the autistic person, I don't think. Um, I had the pleasure of having a wonderful uh, bilingual, twice exceptional 14-year-old who is non-speaking come and lecture for my class two, three weeks ago. And um, what we found is his responses were extremely complex. Um, I would have thought, coming from a speaking model, that if uh, someone asked me a question and I had to use technology to communicate, I'd probably do yes and no as often as possible. Mm. Uh, but we actually had to wait um, for him to respond because he was so coherent and so fluid and so complex in his communication. Um, words like, it's been a very large delight to be a part of your class tonight, you know, <laughs> and we just waited for him to say what he had to say because he's wow. so smart and he has so much to say. I think also, I was very careful not to ask any questions that he could say yes and no to. Oh, um, my okay. husband suffers from that problem. Uh, our son is, is verbal. Uh, he monologues a lot, but my husband has a tendency to say, how was fill in the blank. How was your training session? How was class? And that's always going to get a fine response, or it was good, or it was okay. Um, but if you say, tell me what you did today, you see that more complex language. I'm not a, a language person. I'm just speaking from a, a mom point of view and, and an autistic point of view. Um, I would say the same thing about eye contact. You know, that's not for us. We don't need to make eye contact to communicate. Um, and if we get to know you and we feel comfortable in your space, we probably will. It probably will be rhythmically different. Um, we may look away more often, uh, but you know, I can tell you that uh, on Zoom is killing me and I'm a very verbal person, but mm. everybody on my screen is moving in some way, <laughs> you know? And so trying to focus during uh, Zoom education, I think would be very difficult for somebody with an immature, um, or maybe an ADHD-oriented type of attentional issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
So I think there's just tricks we have to learn in terms of trying to facilitate. And I think, you know, embracing one goal, which every student can aspire to, every adult can aspire to, which is becoming your own personal best. That's not in reflection or in comparison to anyone else. It's all about your own personal growth and development, right? And so I think if we focus on that, instead of focusing on fitting in or trying to please other people or, um, you know, things like that, I think as a parent, my job was to create space for him to communicate whatever way he chose to communicate. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't to force him to communicate in a way that other people are more comfortable with. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I just said, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's more like, uh, you know, the family would always know the family members, uh, uh, obviously, you know, we're raising her and it's a it's my daughter, but we're raising her and every day we know her gestures, we understand her, family members understand her. But when we go outside in the real world, not everybody will pick up or understand her. So she has to use her communication device to, you know, we got, we got it like about a year, a little over a year ago now. So she's not using all the words, but that's my concern is, is trying to explain to somebody who don't, wouldn't understand her gestures just like that to, you know, uh, what is it she really is wanting or asking for. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, technology based or it could just be some need or something that she wants. Well, I think things get better, right? Um, and we yeah. have a friend, Chloe Rothschild, who's very verbal, but when she presented at the United Nations, she talked about how under stress, she still prefers to go back to her technology. Um, mm. So I think, you know, weighing the benefits, right, um, is, is, is the purpose to instruct her, right? <laughs> I feel this way about handwriting, by the way. Is the mm. purpose to learn handwriting or is the purpose to communicate? And if the goal is to communicate, then we need to make it expeditious and less labor intensive. But if the goal is to actually teach how to speak or how to communicate verbally or how to use handwriting, then that has to be a separate instruction. I'm not a big fan of like multitasking. I think it's too complicated. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for the question though. Thanks for yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher or uh, Dr. Dunkley, do either of you wanna jump on that or? Okay. All right, uh, Rafia. Oh, sorry. Okay, you're unmuted. Uh, uh, so this is this is the challenge of trying to synchronize communication over Zoom. Uh, Rafia, thank you so much for your question. Um, all right, um, we our next question is from Jenny. Hi, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Dunkley what you said um, just uh, the game about screens and how they affect us and affect our children. Um, I am a high school counselor and I'm a mom of seven-year-old twins. Um, my, um, I was really impressed with information. I'd A, like to know where can I get more information about what you're offering uh, or what you're sharing. And then B, how, how does that relate to Zoom school? Um, you know, where children are, the rule is two to four. I have high school kids who are on six hours a day uh, on a screen. So could you speak to that? Sure. Okay. So the, the best resource is, is the book Reset Your Child's Brain that goes into a lot more detail about the physiology and case, re, case studies, as well as how to actually do it and all the practical stuff that comes with it. Um, there's also just kind of a nuts and bolts version on my website that's free, um, drdunkley.com slash video games. And then um, I wrote an article on psychology today called autism and screen time, special brains, special risks that kind of goes over all of the, the vulnerability aspects I was talking about. Great. Thank you. Um, as well as some of the research. Okay. So as far as school, um, it's the bane of my existence. <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, so many families are really in stress and they feel like they're torturing their kid and it's awful. So what we've been doing, what I've been doing in my practice is, um, is, is we have the parent ask for as many paper or hands-on assignments as possible. Um, some kids we say they can't be on the screen at all. I mean, many of the kids I should say. Uh, sometimes the school says, okay, we understand, we get it. Sometimes the school resists. I've, I've writ been writing medical waivers. So you could ask your pediatrician for a medical waiver. Mm -hmm. um, and every school is different, even within the same district. But the more that you 
you know, talk to them, explain like why it's so intolerable and it's a safety issue or, you know, they can't sleep or, you know, if you use some kind of um, physiological reason. Mm -hmm. um, and especially, I think if you get a health practitioner involved to support you, that helps. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's really hard. And also I think trying, um, some, and also some of, the, some of the teachers will say, just log on and you know, the kid doesn't have to be in front of the screen, but as long as you log on, they can count the kid present at least. <laughs> right. And then, and then the, pe the teacher can, I mean, the parent can kind of be the eyes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a problem. Okay, thank you. Um, other, other thoughts on that uh, as well, Christopher or Dina? Oh, Dina, you're muted. I just put in the chat box uh, a book resource that's really, I found very interesting. It's not brand new, but it's not, and it isn't autism specific, but it's called In the Shadow of the Net. And it talks about internet addiction. I think it's a really good resource. Um, the other thing I wanted to discuss are these funny blue glasses that I wear. Um, I and my son have been in Erlen filters. I put that in the box too at Erlen.com. Um, Erlenville filters uh, filter out light and color that cause visual distortion. Um, my son and I present very differently in our autism. He is <clears throat> probably more stereotypically what you might consider when you look at a, an adult with autism, a male. Um, I am an extrovert on steroids, whereas he's more on the shy end of the spectrum, but neither of us are in the middle of the bell curve, if you will. <clears throat> but we both have this visual processing issue. Um, his was so significant that as soon as we introduced technology, he developed seizures. He had a grand mall in the middle of our living room. And um, so what these colors do is they filter out for him and I both. Uh, for him, it filters out a lot of color. His colors are almost black. They're so dark. He's very photophobic. Mine filter out yellow and orange and red colors. Um, we were successful in getting the lenses paid for by the public schools as assistive technology. It was a battle. Um, we kind of tweaked the truth a little bit. Uh, we put him in the lenses and asked the school to reimburse for them. Uh, well, we didn't tell them we paid for them because they don't ever reimburse. But um, we made an arrangement with the provider that she would reimburse us if the school paid. And what we saw is that his need for pull-out instruction for sensory diet for a tremendous amount of staff time diminished so dramatically that the school was happy to pay for them. Um, and so it, it took us a little effort. Um, the low-tech version of this is the colored overlays that you may have seen in schools, but that doesn't protect you on the screen, doesn't protect you in the environment overall. They're very fragile, they're difficult to use. The glasses are actually more accessible, I think. Um, my son never had a seizure after we put him in the lenses. Um, I was testing behind him, if you will, because he was in my lap as I was testing. So it was a shock to me to find out that the reason I was not successful in my master's program at reading journal articles. Yeah, we still have card catalogs back then, Tim, but they were paper journals and they were very glossy. And uh, I couldn't keep my train of thought because I couldn't focus visually on the page because of the glare. So um, I just encourage people to look into Erlen lenses. If you look at Google Images, you see Dan Amon's uh, fMRIs of the brain before and after the lenses. They do help with dysregulation for me more than anything. But now that we're on the computer, it's a godsend. Um, the last thing I want to bring up is ergonomics. Um, I have another set of Erlen filters that are um, my, my trifocals, if you will, the progressives. And for the first two years of graduate school, I found myself sitting at the computer like this, trying to read through the bottom of my lenses. And you can imagine what that does to all of this, your shoulders, your neck, your back. And so I got a single pair of lenses that are only the bottom part of the progressives, only the, the I'm sorry, the middle, the computer distance. And what it does is it allows me to have better posture, better ergonomics, Make sure if the kids are using uh, a, a laptop or they're using an iPad, that it's up. My computer is up on two or three books to get it up so that I'm at eye level. If they're looking down at the computer, you're gonna have similar issues with the motor and the physiology of mm -hmm. accessing the technology. The best thing I saw is turning your computer onto your television. 
right? Because it's massive. And, you know, if you have kids that are having trouble regulating because they're not seeing grown up human beings, they're still seeing little tiny people, it really, really helps if the people are big people, like on your big computer, um, on your TV. So if you can transition onto your television, that's even better if you put the desk in front of the TV. Mm -hmm. So those are just some things that have come through my uh, Facebook groups that I thought were brilliant ideas, things that I use, and I hope that's helpful to someone else out there. Thank you. Thank you so uh, so much, Sheena. And um, one thing I would add is, as well, and this is a perhaps more 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 conventional, but I think important to mention to Jenny's point, which is of course you know salient to all of us living in our zoomified worlds these days, um, is uh, and this relates to something I mentioned earlier, as well as Dr. Alper, uh, which was on, um, which is sort of you know in structured uh, sort of digital or video diets. And be, you know, trying to, uh, and you can hopefully work with uh, your school district on this, right? The idea of just sort of continually being on the screen all day long. It's hard enough for any of us. I don't know about the rest of you. Certainly for me, when I spend my days like this, I mean, my, I, I, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to your eyes. It's exhausting to your brain. It's exhausting to your executive function system. Um, so, you know, creating. Um, you know, breaks clear structured windows of time um, for not looking at the screen at all, but also thinking about, you know, about some of this, the, this reward piece, right? So, uh, you know, making, if somebody has a, uh, something that a, a child, your child has, you know, activity that is, that is rewarding, allowing that to be uh, in part of that interspersed system so that, um, so that it doesn't just become you know, class on the on the TV, on the screen with all of the different conflicting challenges that Dr. Duckley was talking about, and then occasionally something else that's hard to you know, that's hard to to want to do as well. So that so that you can make sure that there's that that you're you're creating you know clear delineations, clear breaks, and clear motivation uh, sort of in each section. And hopefully your your district can work with you on that, uh, uh, Christopher. Yeah, I just wanted to add one quick thing too, is that, you know, I think the one thing to be very careful about is I think one of the biggest threats to the autism community is social isolation, right? And one thing that every child had before was going to school. And we knew a lot of kids with autism that it was their only social opportunity was going to school and they didn't do a lot much else out of there. And so, you know, I think we have to really weigh the costs and benefits of, you know, if technology is the only way to maintain these social connections with classmates and peers and family members, you know, how does that fit in? into some of the risks that come along with technology use. And so you know, I think just like the general population, we've seen a lot of individuals with autism go through periods of depression just from the lack of connection. And we're all feeling that to some degree as well, right? And so I think Matt, like what you're talking about too, if we're gonna prioritize technology use, you know, we have to make sure that we include those important connections so that these yeah. kids don't become isolated. Yeah, um, and la uh, last, oh yes, please. Um, I was just gonna say for a lot of these kids have they're in special ed and then they have OT, speech and ABA or some kind of behavioral intervention all through Zoom, if, you know, if not every day, like throughout the week. And I just wanna say, it's okay to not do those things if you don't feel it's helpful. So a lot of, you know, I think parents feel pressure because it's a service that's being offered that they have to use it and that, you know, what if he gets behind on his speech, but then they're telling me that the speech isn't, it's not working or, you know, that the kid's just crying during the session. So it's okay to stop those, especially during the pandemic, you know, to stop those services if they're only through Zoom. Excellent, excellent key uh, advice there that I think many people won't um, uh, necessarily think of. A few other uh, key things to mention. First of all, you know, really important in case this isn't self-evident, but, you know, being in touch with other parents in your own district uh, so that you're working to get aware of what others are doing, how they're responding. Every district is its own little fiefdom in some ways. Uh, and so, uh, you know, being able to, to work together and know what's available, know what other people are, are being offered. There might be something that surprises you that your district is doing that you could say, oh, that might be useful for my child. You know, so you, when you, in New York, they're called SEPTAs, Special Education Parent Teacher Associations. Uh, other states call them other things, but, you know, using uh, those kinds of resource, uh, resources uh, as families together is important. Uh, also making sure, important to make sure that your te child's teacher knows what screen your child is using at home so that there is this kind of coordination or that there are, you know, they are uh, 
a, a, you know, if that is a challenge, right? If your child is, you know, potentially, you know, walk, doing school on a phone all day, you know, that's a, it's really important to be, for a teacher to be aware of and respond to, because that, that's going to impact, impact their learning, especially in comparison to what, what Dina was talking about before. And of course, trial and error, right? You know, and I think this is a theme that cuts across a lot of what we're doing. It's right now, everything feels like it's trial and error. And so it's our job uh, to, to allow ourselves to sort of, you know, institute that, that flexibility uh, and, and to remain flexible as the world continues to change. Um, Thank you, Jenny. And with that, uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, and so uh, I'd like to uh, throw it back to Dr. Herstel Pietra, who um, is going to put a, a bow on this whole wonderful event for us. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, um, Temple, Merrill, Christopher, Victoria, and Dina for sharing your experience and expertise with us today. And thank you, uh, you the audience, for joining us today and for engaging in this really important conversation. We hope that today's discussion has been enlightening and has equipped you with a few new tools for health and di digital media use in your families. To continue learning about this topic, please be sure to visit our website, where we'll post additional insight in the coming days. We'll also be posting a YouTube video of today's workshop, which we encourage you to share with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and friends. For more from Children's Screens, please follow us on social media at the account shown on your screen. Our discussions about digital media use and children's well-being will continue throughout the rest of the year. On Wednesday, November 4th at noon, we'll discuss digital media, social comparison, and body image. Then on Wednesday, November 18th at noon, Experts will show you how you and your children can harness creativity online. Stay tuned for more information on both of these upcoming events. When you leave the workshop, you'll see a link to a short survey. Please click on the link and let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Thanks again, and everyone, stay safe and well. Bye-bye. <laughs>